I am in a technical visit in Stanford University uh, by the program um, Print, uh, also the support program for academic and scientific community on abroad. Uh, it's important, it's a 10 days, only 10 days for a mission in, in other university, uh, but it, it's an hour for me uh, to be here and uh, talking with you about my researches. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is to bring the overview of my research uh, in the field of environmental education, particularly in its critical conceptions, articulating uh, environmental sustainability and social equity. My presentation about me, I started teaching when I was 16 uh, in kids' garden. <laughs> uh, I was younger, and uh, my family needs uh, money. And uh, I uh, like to teach since I was a child. <laughs> and uh, I begin. Uh, to work in, in with the kids. I have worked uh, as a science and biology teacher in elementary and high school uh, for many years uh, before the work in university. I am undergraduate in biology sciences uh, and the teacher degree and bachelor de uh, degree, masters in ecology, and the doctorate in education and the, uh, in both uh, degrees, I work with environmental education. I have been a researcher in environmental education since 1999. I construct a research group in Federal University of ABC, my first uh, work in, in university and uh, in the master degree uh, I did research in environmental education in pre-service teacher training and in the PhD degree I studied the national environmental education TV program uh, named TV scholar TV scholar in Brazil and the TV school had uh, a space for a program about environmental. And uh, we uh, analyzed uh, this program. A distance from SMC. Yes, yes. Uh, I am a leader of the researchers group on environmental education and teacher training. In Portuguese, the civil is GPAF. And uh, I will work the, uh, with pre-service and in-service teacher training since uh, 2006. And in in, in pre-service, I work with internship uh, in public schools. And in, in service, I work in continuous formation, little uh, or uh, the or specialization, for example. Uh, me and the assistant coordinator for the PED USP program. Uh, when I know Professor Rachel and the, uh, Professor uh, Baitia, a letter for me. Uh, <laughs> to stay here uh, for the program. And by link, uh, by lads, by work ID. And my family, uh, Rachel, <laughs> now my family yesterday. Uh, I have uh, two shoes, uh, not two <laughs> shoes, it's the young. And uh, uh, they are with me in California. So with you, the whole time? Yes, uh, in San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Um, my agenda for uh, my presentation is the context for the research, uh, particularly Brazil, uh, 
theoretic references in environmental education, environmental justice, and digital training, uh, research results, and the discussion, and the final consideration of the questions. My context, uh, I like <laughs> very much this picture. Uh, this picture shows the diversity of the people in Brazil. And I think the diversity uh, of its peoples is Brazil's great power, not a problem, it's power. Uh, the diversity in biology is uh, a power. In, uh, with a person is a power too for me. And uh, Aline, uh, the beige picker, the beige picker exists. É, catadora de, de lixo. Garbage, garbage uh, collector. Uh, deliver the president's uh, sex. And uh, the conservation of biodiversity and the social diversity needs to be thrown off together because it, uh, the environmental education not is only for protect a biodiversity, but a social diversity too. And uh, social environmental problems is very common in, in Brazil. Some have situation. And uh, uh, the solar station, forest fires, landslides, uh, extinction of biodiversity, floods, uh, excess garbage, pandemics around the world, but pandemics uh, in Brazil, uh, a similar uh, United States was a, a, a big problem, and uh, the vulnerable peoples was more um, more uh, more uh, more died for example. And uh, in the same table, the same uh, moment of the pandemic, besides the pandemic, is Brazilians have to face a combinations of disasters such as floods, forest fires, and landslides. And uh, because the climate change, uh, these disasters are becoming more and more frequent and severe. And these disasters, uh, the vulnerable person are more uh, affected by disasters uh, and very and in Brazil, more than 80 million people uh, live in disaster area. And uh, there are 27,000 risk areas in Brazil. In the risk areas, there are habitations. Uh, this is a very problematic. Um, my university. University of São Paulo is a, a bigger university in Latin America. And in the ranking, uh, is considered the, the, the best university for Latin America. There are nine campuses uh, in São Paulo uh, State. And uh, the Biosciences Institute uh, is in uh, campus of São Paulo uh, capital. The Bioscience Institute, there are uh, five uh, uh, departments, zoology, ecology, uh, physiology, bot botany and genetics. And uh, in these departments, uh, there are one science education professor for example, me in zoology department, 
uh, Professor Daniela in Ecology Department. Uh, each department there are a professor specializing in science education because the Institute former uh, bachelor bachelor's degree and the uh, teacher training uh, degree. And my post-graduation programs that I work is interunit post-graduation program in science teaching. Uh, there are three uh, areas to concentrate on. Uh, te uh, teaching physics, teaching chemistry, teaching biology. And uh, involve four USP, uh, faculties. It was uh, created in 1973. It's a program um, completing 50 years in this year. And the lines of investigations is didactic courses for teaching sciences, history, philosophy, and the future in science teaching, science teaching learning, uh, teacher training, and the scientific dissemination and North formal education. The program has already graduated uh, 600, 603 master and 127 PhDs. Uh, many, many theses and dissertations as product in this program. And this is my research group in environmental education, the teacher training. The uh, group uh, exists since uh, 2010. And there are five uh, lines of investigation. Excuse me. Uh, five lines of investigation. Uh, the main investigation is color environmental education and the two a teacher training environmental education, the three media and the environmental education, environmental education in protected areas and in their communities, and the sustainability and the equity in environmental education in a history society. This uh, link for the, the, the group. And uh, in my research group, the main objective, uh, objectives of my research is to investigate the collaborative constructions of plans and practices of environmental education with teachers in a public school, as well as providing the disseminations of this knowledge about innovative practices developed by teachers. And the process uh, has involved the conversations and interviews with the managers, teachers, the students, educators, and the productions of different social actors. And the researches are based on quantitative and qualitative approaches and in some cases using the participatory action research. And my theoretical references in environmental education, environmental justice and the teacher training, I will present you. My researches in environmental education involving part uh, partnership with schools and the uh, network. Uh, in education and uh, work with interventions with knowledge productions. Uh, we based in autonomy, teacher autonomy, active citizenship, uh, emancipation and participations in activities and use complexity, critical theory, sociocultural perspectives, social learning, scientific literacy and the dialogues, discourses, analyzes. Some names uh, of the authors that I 
use it in my searches in some theoretical references. And the after page, I, uh, I saw me uh, in this, uh, the, the references about education to equity. And for example, Professor Rachel and the book and the, the, the other uh, references about the learning communities by Brandão in Brazil and Isabel Orellana uh, in Canada. Um, teacher training about reflexive, about uh, intellectual teacher training. Uh, I work in, in environmental education, this reference is about critical environmental education. And the situation uh, about the teachers in Brazil, of Brazil is different. Uh, the teachers in, is important to show this date because in primary and secondary schools, teaching practices uh, tend to reproduce experiences uh, live in, in our store more than uh, references students. And need practices, uh, need to, to live the different experience to use in schools. Uh, and the other day, uh, other uh, that important is that Teacher in Brazil reported is spending 25 hours uh, a week teaching in, in class. And the, the other, uh, the six hours uh, more than the Thales, Thales uh, you know, the Thales uh, research, uh, is, is about uh, teacher out of the world and bio CV. And the, the, the courses is problematic because the professors have many, many uh, hours in class. And it's difficult to, uh, to find the hours for students. How many, like how much preparation do teachers have per class? The hours for preparation. Yeah, if, if you this teach one class, class right? one class of teaching, I guess that's 45 minutes. Like, how much preparation time will, will one teacher have? Yeah, on average. Mm -hmm. uh, a little time. For example, uh, in, in stage, the professor had 25 hours in the uh, classes and five hours to prepare only. How many, it's, it's how many of these classes are basically the same class, but to different groups? Yes, in high school. Yeah, I'm just saying, this 25 thing? hours in class, no. but they're not all different classes. I mean, it's in just... different classes, in different classes. No, and the I first year, different. second year. No, to year. speak to Nicholas's point, is are these 25 hours of um, the same class 25 times or four classes six times? No more. Four, because four different for example, classes. in biology, yeah. uh, you have these two, two classes, two hours for a week per class. Per, per class. And then uh, 25 hours, uh, you have uh, 10 classes. For but they might be given like three. Three, three, six degrees, three, seven uh, degrees, uh, three, seven degrees. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so they might be teaching three different, three classes which require different preparation. Yes. Yes. Eight times in five hours. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. So, so one third. So five out of twenty-five is a little, yeah. a little bit. Do you understand my point? I do. Yeah, yes. I do. So it depends on that. I don't know what the answer, the real answer is. It's all complex. In, in, in Sao Paulo, network, 
uh, there are 15 hours to prepare, but the, the hours involve meetings about bureaucratic uh, words, not to only prepare. Prepare five, uh, eight hours. This uh, is a main problem for me. So, according to the people that develop systems, they say that their system is strategically good. They have the student book and the teacher book. So, the only thing that people need to do, I'm generalizing, but uh, the sexual people, but in general, they read the book and they keep reading the book. And that's how they operate. Really bad. Yes. Um, uh, it's difficult to, to prepare a different class because of the time. Mm -hmm. but is, is, is this the same in full day schools as in elementary schools? No, no, on half day because some of the some percent of these no, teachers teach in the different schools. Integral, uh, the integral schools is different. It's different, uh, yeah. but I don't know. I, I don't work here with you. But some of these teachers. Uh, Teach in different schools. In different schools. Most of them. No, 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 no it's not most. So the most, the most, most, most teachers, teachers, teachers teach in teachers. more than one school. More than one school. Yeah. Most, yes. teachers, yes. teachers. most teachers. Most teachers. Most teachers. Yes. Even in secondary. Yeah. Even yeah. Most teachers. And in some parts. Right. In some parts. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah. Pernambuco is changing. Yeah. But in Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo. Yeah. Two, uh, I know teachers that we work in. In state classes, in municipal classes, and in the private classes, three so schools. This is a problem much for teacher training. If if I'm a teacher and I just teach in one non full day school, if that's my choice, how much do I teach? How much would I teach? How many hours? Depends on the size of the school. Ten? What? Ten a week or what? what what's your question? Yeah. Ten a week. It depends yeah. on but the this school. Twenty-five hours a week. Yeah. yeah. But this means teachers. You're saying mostly teachers pick up these twenty-five hours over multiple schools. So, but, but, but the twenty-five is for school. one school. Yeah. Five hours a day, and then they go to a second school. In a big school, is possible. So they teach more than twenty-five hours a week. Yeah. So this is your requirement for one school. If you want to contract in a school, this is what you're going to teach, even if it's a half day school. It's 20 hours. It's 20 hours. It depends on the network. Depends the network. So you're saying your teachers that teach 60 hours? Yes, 60 hours, 10 hours, not sufficient for pay the, the bills. <laughs> You know, this doesn't make sense. It does, it, no, it doesn't it, make it, sense because if you're saying that I can teach in multiple schools, then obviously I can sign a contract which is less than 25 hours. Yeah, it depends on whether it's state or private school. Private school, you can sign a contract for less. Yeah, but so, so it's not true that if I'm teaching in a school half day, that I must be teaching 25 hours a week. That's not true. No. No, okay, that's the question I asked. Mm -hmm. So what percentage of the teachers in a school actually teach in one school 25 hours a week? You say most teachers teach multiple schools. Yes. So, yes. And most teachers are not on permanent contracts. Is that correct? So most teachers, so I do have a choice as a teacher yes. whether I want to teach 25 hours a week or 10 hours a week. Yes. So what percentage, so what is, I, I think there are two issues. What is the distribution of teaching load across the teachers, all the teachers of Sao Paulo State? That's what I want to know. What's the average? What's the mode? Okay, that's, a, that's the answer to my question. Not that if you have a full-time contract in a school, you teach 25 hours a week. I think my point is not like how many hours you teach, but the 
the ratio between preparation and teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you are uh, well, I'm teaching, if I'm teaching 10 hours a week, I might have five hours preparation. No, right? then you have two hours because no. they're not paying you. I'm paid for, but I have a lot more time to prepare than I'm not paid. You're talking about paid preparation time, yeah. not preparation time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, those <laughs> that's yeah. important because if I'm only teaching 10 hours a week, yeah. then I have a lot more time to prepare. This, what, what, the, what the argument here is, is there's so many hours of teaching that basically you don't have time during the week to prepare. That's the argument, not paid preparation time. If you're a teacher, you get you prepare to the degree that you feel necessary. If you're teaching a lot of hours a week, paid or unpaid, you simply don't have time to do it. That's Wouldn't your it be nice though to get paid for what you work? That's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a rhetorical gambit. That is a rhetorical gambit because it is, it is. Because if I'm paid to that, if I'm paid to sell, to the salary that I'm being paid, if that, that salary is inadequate, Okay, compared to other people at university education, that's one argument. But how much I prepare versus how much I teach has to do with this range of. Uh, well, Japan said that they don't have much weight. They give more preparation time. Yes. Yeah, but that's a negotiation between the teachers. Yes. And the I agree. I, I'm not arguing with that. I just want to know what the real data are on. What, how much teachers are preparing in Sweden? They teach a lot less, right? Yes, they teach a lot less, and allegedly they have a lot of preparation time. Yes, yeah, that's true, but that's that's a negotiation between the teachers' unions and, and, mm -hmm. and the state. Um, uh, they, uh, they anyway. integral schools, yeah. full time, they're full time in schools. Yeah. Uh, intended to solving this problem, but uh, I don't know the, the time of the classes in relationship to time of the preparations. In, do you know in, in full schools? I don't know. I need to investigate this. It would be nice to know what that distribution is. Yes. I think there, there are data about the distribution, I and mean, we could talk about it after, but yeah, there are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there are data. I mean, Moriconi has worked on this, so we have some information. Um, <laughs> no problem. And uh, I worked, uh, I have worked uh, the preference that she considered the teachers as an intellectual profession. Uh, for example, Jim Hooks, uh, the professor should become transformative intellectuals. Uh, if they are to educate the students to be active critical citizens. And Dali uh, Hammond, and Thomas Stanford, teaching, uh, teaching as a professional that serves democratic purpose, which prepare young people for equal participation in society and in political and citizen dimensions. Is important because the professors uh, sometimes have a uh, low uh, uh, esteem, no esteem, low esteem. And in my uh, courses, I begin to talk. Uh, you are intellectual. You are having a professional, an intellectual profession not is a, a technical <coughs> and it is important for, uh, to collect that the teachers uh, know. Uh, teachers know many things and it is important to show this. And uh, for environmental uh, education, uh, there are many points or, or conceptions. For example, uh, conservationist, resolutive, systemic, scientific, uh, and I work, I choose for my uh, researches the critical conceptions. And uh, there are, this work is by Lucy Sauvet, is a researcher 
in Canada, that mapping uh, researches in environmental education around the world and uh, show these conceptions, 50, 50 conceptions. But in my uh, doctoral and the master uh, studies, I uh, show is a critical, not pragmatic, not conservative, but critical environmental education. And uh, I analyze the, this uh, practices and the programs and the TV programs in five dimensions, human environmental relationship, vision of the science and the technology, political participations, ethical values, and the pedagogical activities. Uh, for example, in pragmatic environmental education, I need uh, to teach uh, only separate the trabalho, only uh, solving the problem. But in a critical environmental education, uh, we need uh, the transformative practices. I, I show in this slide many uh, characteristics for uh, critical environmental education. I, uh, I try to uh, strengthen for individual, but many collective actions Mediations between traditional and future uh, and scientific knowledges, the constructive of environmental realities with a view to transforming what causes the problem, not apparent, not only apparent problems, but the causes of the problems. And the, uh, I work with the environmental and the social justice. Uh, together, citizenship, and the environmental as an object of transformation and the place of emancipation. Not only a problem, not only nature, but is a lot of emancipation and the transformative practices. And I use uh, practices in collective, collaborative, interdisciplinary, and uh, democratic, participative, and dialogue, dialogue practices. Could you? And uh, I need, uh, we need environmental education, work with knowledge, excuse me, this is like in, in Portuguese. Uh, I work in the political dimension for uh, uh, environment using knowledge, value, and the forms of participations. Not only uh, learning, but learning and transforming in actions, in quotidian actions. And I work with the system, uh, the integrations of knowledge. Uh, this paper is about uh, protected areas and the communities. I need to uh, integrate the not only uh, traditional knowledge or science, scientific knowledge, but I need to integrate the scientific knowledge uh, together. For example, human sciences with uh, natural sciences, with biological sciences, with education sciences in, in blue uh, here, and the, with the, uh, traditional knowledges. For example, uh, indigenous knowledges. Uh, communities knowledges because in not uh, uh, only uh, plus but cross fertilizations of knowledges in this situation and this is very important to the study of the environment 
And uh, in critical environmental education, environmental education and human heart, uh, rights is together. Uh, the diversity of nature and its associated cultural diversity are foundation for a new paradigm of society. For example, uh, excuse me. Uh, for example, in indigenous uh, locals, there are lots uh, problems with uh, nature, with uh, destructions of natures. But uh, the minerations, uh, the deforestations, we. Uh, I um, uh, pressionando the pressure the indigenous communities because in indigenous community, communities it is not possible to destroy the nature. Then it destroys indigenous communities or destroy the nature. It's a terrible problem in Brazil. The uh, anti you need to construct on the sustainability by facing environmental injustice. Environmental injustice is neither the cost of pollution, nor the benefits of environmental protections are evenly distributed across the society. Uh, the better environmental places, uh, there are populations, uh, there are rich, or uh, populations that uh, have conditions to live well. And in risky areas for environmental assets, uh, live the vulnerable peoples. Uh, this is a name due to racist environment. Uh, and we uh, needs to target environmental justice, fair treatment and full involvement of social groups in decisions about access to occupations and the use of environmental resources. For example, in this research, uh, recently published uh, in Portuguese, uh, Nós e as Desigualdades, uh, there are updates about uh, climate changes causing desigualdades, uh, uh, inequalities. Climate changes cause inequalities too, because uh, activists highlight the confronting effects the climate crisis in people, blacks, and the peripheral communities, pointing out the impacts of events extremes weather events, such as floods, floods and landslides, and the population rising in precarious conditions. Uh, the pandemic situation were different in, in vulnerable person, person than uh, the other person. And uh, in environmental education in curriculums, need to emphasize nature as a source of life, as well as the interrelation, interrelations between the environmental dimensions and the social justice, human rights, healthy work, consumptions, ethical, racial, gender, sexual diversities, overcomings, racism and the all forms for discriminations and the social injustice, environmental and the social justice uh, will be working together. And they use it to uh, culture circles by Paulo Freire. And uh, there are three pedagogical moments, the local investigation, and the choice of generations teams enable the understanding of a reality and the problematizations, critical and reflexive views of students to change these realities. Uh, 
and the uh, and the results by researchers. Uh, my first researches in. Uh, is, that uh, is it better for you to speak in Portuguese? I can read it in English. Um, 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 é, com uma regra básica e trabalhamos com professores a produção de novas regras, porque o jogo podia ser é, trabalhado com crianças pequenas ou com crianças de ensino médio, com jovens de ensino médio, e a regra precisava ser diferente é, nessas duas situação, dessas duas situações. Né? Eles avaliaram os professores fizeram uma avaliação do jogo e de seu uso na classe e avaliaram como um importante recurso didático para trabalhar com mudanças climáticas, especialmente com aspectos de adaptação e mitigação, porque a mídia é, explora aspectos das consequências, não explora causas, não explora como é, se adaptar e mitigar os problemas. E o jogo focou... É, The Fox is about adaptations. <laughs> In I work uh, the the change the slide is uh, uh, or the uh, the other project uh, I have eu tenho um projeto em educação ambiental na rede municipal de São Paulo desde 2019, onde eu sou uma é, assessora da, das políticas de educação ambiental do município, das práticas escolares e da formação continuada dos professores. Quando eu comecei esse trabalho eu consegui um financiamento também do CNPq pelo programa Ciência na Escola, foi um programa que foi é, publicado, um edital publicado em 2019, para fazer uma pesquisa sobre essa realidade, identificando os desafios e as possibilidades né, do, da, das escolas é, então, eu quis saber o que as escolas produziam, o que as escolas já faziam é, depois da produção do novo currículo, o novo currículo, e aí sim, eu posso mostrar esse slide, o novo currículo, ele é organizado com é, a relação dos objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável, os 17 objetivos do desenvolvimento sustentável, com os objetivos de aprendizagem de cada disciplina e de cada eixo. Então, esse é o currículo da prefeitura. Quando eu entrei na prefeitura, foi para trabalhar esse currículo com os professores, mas eu quis fazer um, um deslocamento da centralidade do currículo para a centralidade das práticas escolares que já eram desenvolvidas e como elas poderiam ser potencializadas a partir do novo currículo, a partir da nova proposta. O que os professores já faziam, por exemplo, sobre é, mudanças climáticas, ou sobre vida na terra, sobre vida na água, o que já era feito, não trazendo como algo totalmente... Você 
você que está falando? Tá. Não é isso. Era isso que eu estava pensando. Eu preciso de ser mais garantido. Olha, voltou a ligar. Então era isso mesmo. Só que o sofrimento. Ah, ele estava sem carga. Ok, tá Foi bem. Bem. Isso que o som tá... voltou. Né? Então, pode continuar. Pode, sim. Pode não. continuar. Como é que você reage a problemas de TI em português? Ah. <laughs> they, they can hear Cristina e Eduardo. Good. So, this... Okay, ainda, Fernando, você, você ainda. Não, mas a aqui é o filme da apresentação. Tá ouvindo? Você está apresentando? Não, okay. essa não é a okay. apresentação. Okay. Uh, no, pode continuar. Let's continue. Continue. Okay. They can hear you fine. So just... Okay. <coughs> é, então, nós começamos fazendo uma pesquisa com 1.300. A gente enviou para as 1.350 escolas. Okay. Okay. Pode mudar. Realmente foi a coordenadora pedagógica. E a gente perguntava sobre problemas ambientais e ações que já eram desenvolvidas em educação ambiental. Lógico que várias escolas responderam que ainda não desenvolviam ações, mas várias descreveram as ações. E o que a gente observou quando perguntava para citar os três principais problemas socioambientais é, da escola ou do seu entorno, é que os três principais eram relacionados à vulnerabilidade social. É, embora eles citaram e indicaram também, mas é, o descarte inadequado de resíduos sólidos, muitas vezes por comunidades onde não tinham coleta de resíduos sólidos, problemas habitacionais e vulnerabilidade social. E chamamos a atenção como muitas escolas, né, quase é, 400 escolas destacaram problemas com poluição sonora. Poluição sonora, poluição do ar, insegurança alimentar. Então, são problemas bastante sérios que as escolas né, precisam resolver. Precisam resolver muito antes. Né, de, de a, a formação dos professores é essencial, mas ela não, é, ela não vai resolver esses problemas. Então, eles precisam ser, de alguma forma, fazer um, um comentário que eu acho claro. interessante como um, um ponto de referência para a sua análise. É, teve uma discussão grande aqui na Califórnia em relação à eletrificação da frota, né, de carro elétrico. E, paradoxalmente, você iria imaginar que a preferência pela eletrificação da frota veio dos distritos com maior poder aquisitivo, mas não veio veio dos distritos com menos acesso a recursos no estado da Califórnia. Por quê? Exatamente embasando o que você está dizendo. É, os mais vulneráveis, e esse é um fenômeno global, né? tem se falado muito sobre isso, por exemplo, o que está acontecendo no, as, as, as enchentes no Paquistão esse ano, que são um outro, né? quer dizer, o quanto o problema de aquecimento global né, e de, de mudanças climáticas vão afetar os países mais Vão aumentar as desigualdades. Vão aumentar, e vão afetar é. os, os mais vulneráveis. Então, assim, eu acho que quando você fala, por exemplo, de poluição sonora, né, para quem... Quantidade de volume de motocicleta na periferia brasileira e motocicleta passando em alta velocidade perto de uma sala de aula, ela interrompe. É. né aquele aquele momento né Aí ela acaba com aquela oportunidade né do professor o lugar de fala do professor o que ele está tentando trazer então eu acho que a gente é muito importante trazer isso porque quando você fala né de de problemas de, de poluição sonora ou poluição do ar que parecem é, 
luxos ou parecem é, problemas né, de, de terceira ou quarta ordem, né? Não são. são problemas de primeira ordem que precisam ser enfrentados. Então, por exemplo, o quanto a eletrificação da frota de motos em São Paulo ajudaria não só a poluição do ar, quanto a poluição sonora e o benefício que isso para traria as para as escolas. Ninguém nunca falou sobre isso. É. Ninguém nunca falou sobre isso. Mas, assim, é, qualquer um de nós né, que passa cinco minutos em São Paulo saindo daqui ainda, sente, meu, parece que você entrou numa batedeira. Então, assim, é muito importante trazer essa reflexão, porque esses problemas ambientais, obviamente, quando você fala, putz, cobertura vegetal, reflorestamento, isso está muito longe, está muito difícil. Mas, por exemplo, eletrificação de frota, eletrificação de frota de transporte, eletrificação de frota de motocicleta, é absolutamente essencial para você criar ambientes mais propícios para atividade é, acadêmica. Então, eu só queria trazer isso porque Sim. a pesquisa diz e nenhum, ninguém no Brasil fala sobre isso. Ninguém no Brasil fala sobre a, isso. É a questão ambiental assim. é uma questão é, não sei de se alta complexidade, eu não concordo. Se concordo. Onde tudo está relacionado. É, eu, é, a gente trabalha, por exemplo, nas escolas, a articulação entre o currículo o espaço escolar e seu entorno e a gestão é, participativa da escola. Porque de nada adianta eu trabalhar a educação ambiental na sala de aula e eu comprar EVA e, e isopor para artesanato. Né? Então, as coisas precisam estar totalmente ligadas. E acho que esse dado mostra... As escolas são construídas no meio de grandes avenidas. Às vezes tem uma escola... O professor não consegue falar. Eu entrei em escolas e falo, Meu, meus alunos não me ouvem. My students don't hear me. Então, <risos> é, uma, uma pergunta sobre a, a, de onde vem o dado das escolas, regionalmente falando. Porque é, é, é uma curiosidade minha, assim, quanto isso cobre, por exemplo, da região norte. Não, isso é São Paulo. Não, é esse é só o município de São Paulo. É um projeto com o município de São Paulo, que é a rede que eu estou trabalhando. E nós trabalhamos... A, a, o município de São Paulo tem 13 diretorias de ensino. E as 13 diretorias de ensino é, passaram o questionário e a gente conseguiu respostas equilibradas de toda, toda a rede. Dá para respeitar o dado. É, é só o município de São Paulo isso. Sim. Mas eu fico curioso o quanto seria é. diferente em outras regiões do Brasil. A questão de poluição, de poluição sonora no Brasil é um fenômeno. Sim. Uma expansão de frota de motocicleta, assim... It will be solved by electrification, unfortunately. Yeah, but this is yeah, unfortunately, it's... pedestrians won't be able to hear anybody, and therefore you're going to increase a lot no, of this is what's happening in China, but they cover that <laughs> door. But... I don't think this is the problem. No. I think the problem, you quiero preguntar si posso. Claro. Porque temos tres eh, minutos. Oficiales. Meu Deus, eu vou ter que correr muito. <laughs> okay, my, let me say this, that... Uh, Uruguay, I don't know if you know about Uruguay, Uruguay has decided not to use fossil fuels. You know this? Yeah. Okay. And they have greatly reduced, they're now at, at the level of use of fossil fuels of an African country, the much higher Two, two, they're at a very low level of pollution, uh, 2%. Uh, I think they're, I don't know what the index is, but they're at the bottom of the, of the CO2 pollution index. But in order to do this, and they have done creative stuff with uh, solar and wind, however, they have slowed down their growth rate. They have specifically slowed down their growth rate. And they have specifically reduced this sort of get everybody to reduce their consumption. 
they're buying new cars. You don't buy a new car anymore every five years, even if you can afford it. You just reduce your consumption. Okay, in Brazil, the problem is that a lot of people are poor. Yeah. Therefore, the only way you can make them better off is either to redistribute yes. existing people income. In yeah. São Paulo, for the problem of the Amazon is a problem of capitalism, of consumption, of everybody trying to get more. In order to stop that, it means a, a fundamental change in the society. You have said something so important at the beginning of your talk, which for me was very important, was that biodiversity is connected with human diversity. Yes. And cooperation, and cooperation, because biodiversity is cooperation in yes. nature, right? It means cooperation among human beings. This is not what we have right now. Brazil is not in, a, in exactly a cooperative mood right now. Neither is the United States. People are at each other. And the way this is exploited in capitalism is called competition. Kill, kill the other guy. Kill the other woman in order to get what you want, okay? And politicians exploit this by saying, not cooperate. This guy is your enemy. This person is your enemy. This group doesn't look like you. Therefore, they're your enemy. They're trying to get something from you. Therefore, you have to defend yourself, yes. right? Carry a gun, because everybody wants to kill you. Some right, I mean, they're right. There's a gun somewhere. So all of this is a, is gets to the fundamental. Your what you're dealing with, I think you recognize it from what you said. Gets to sort of the fundamental way we organize ourselves as society. How do you teach that? I am <laughs> is not the issue. I think I think you think I think you recognize that that yes, is the issue. Yes, the 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 fossil fuel needs to finish. Uh, in yeah, my but opinion. That's, yeah, but that's but but finishing fossil fuel means you've got to use less resources. Yeah. Yeah, for a long time until you are able to get enough you got to negotiate that with the indians now yes, yes. How, how, do you do, how do you teach kids that we that they really have to organize they're going to have to go out and be activists to organize life differently than so far they have been taught to organize i need you to work with collective practices collective uh, solving problems uh, because uh, the education, my education was individuality, I, I think now. So you're going to, uh, the, I so you're going to go right into the wealthiest private schools in Sao Paulo, okay. and you're going to tell them that yes. they have to give it up. Yes. <laughs> give it up. Yes. That's what you is that what you're going to try to teach them? We are yes. bringing on the revolution. Uh, it's yes. a revolution. It's a question is how do you get people who are used to getting what they want to say, okay, maybe I want some. Martin? So uh, what you're talking is related to you know climate change and environment pro environmental behavior. That's something I've been studying yes. for the last five years. And um, recently there was a meta analysis of uh, from uh, nature climate change, analyzing all the studies out there on the um, drivers of uh, climate change related. So what would motivate you? To you know, have us using a fossil fuel car, using an electric car, or walking or biking to school. And uh, what they found was that um, surprisingly, just knowing about the issue that was something we believe yes. to be a huge driver for behavior uh, is not. It had a small effect 
on the actual behavior had, change. Had a small effect? A small effect. Yeah, yeah. So uh, what is the most important drivers are self-efficacy. So how much uh, people feel that they are really able to engage in a new behavior. Um, the outcome efficacy. So how much they feel that that change in politics, that change on that behavior will uh, have a good impact on the environment and um, how much they perceive the risk of the uh, climate change, for example. Mm -hmm. If they do not feel that as a, an important risk to their health, to their family, they will not engage in a change. So um, what we have been finding is that, uh, for example, with simulations, with virtual reality, they usually perceive the risk as higher, and then they will feel more efficacy on uh, how to engage on the behavior and it leads to higher, you know, also uh, prior environmental behavior. So it ends up to, you know, coming from uh, knowing to acting usually is mediated by the, uh, how much they perceive the risk, how much they feel it's a negative risk for them as well and how much they can really act on the environment. So they are more like- I, I have a simple solution. Okay, I, I'm gonna propose that-, uh, <laughs> that we, uh, No, no we've set. got two minutes left, Mike. So let's let the speaker speak okay. rather than you. Okay. So really, uh, give me a No, no. Okay. Para conclusão. Ok. É, bom, então esse dado aqui também, ele vai mostrar né, que os temas que estão na, nos ODSs, né, nos Objetivos de Desenvolvimento Sustentável, eles já são trabalhados de alguma forma, alguns mais, outros menos, nos diferentes níveis de ensino. Então, essas temáticas a gente buscou conhecer com professores, a gente fez um primeiro seminário com professores para buscar conhecer o que eles já faziam, trabalhando com o Café Compartilha, o Word Café, é, construindo com os professores as práticas que, que poderiam ser desenvolvidas, as práticas bem-sucedidas e outras coisas que a gente poderia trazer das referências de educação ambiental crítica, examinando principalmente aí os links entre o currículo, o espaço físico e a, o gerenciamento aí da escola, né? Então, trabalhando com... A, a, aí fomos trabalhar com a formação dos professores, aqueles eram os primeiros representantes dos professores, com métodos colaborativos e, e, e uma estrutura participativa, porque muitas vezes a educação ambiental é vista como uma, uma regra de comportamentos, então, assim, não é só comportamentos que, que importam, né? e sim a mudar a, a forma como você vê o ambiente, as atitudes que você passa a ter a partir dele, então, a gente desenvolveu alguns é, role playing, né? tem aí, aí o registro né? de, um, de um aluno, sobre uma situação de, de, de role playing, uh, os trabalhos aí coletivos desenvolvidos com os professores em 2019, a gente também trabalhou com um grupo de professores na exposição, visitando a exposição Amazônia, do Sebastião Salgado, eu trouxe aqui algumas imagens até dessa exposição, né, para se tiver de interesse, dar uma olhada para quem está aqui, discutindo a relação dessa exposição com as práticas escolares, o que seria possível de estar trazendo. É, e fomos investigar as práticas das escolas. Então, por exemplo, a gente encontrou uma escola que tem até o um vídeo em que os estudantes eles, é, fizeram uma análise, um mapeamento do entorno. É, esse projeto foi junto com a FAO, a Faculdade de Arquitetura, e planejar um parque linear no local em que era um depósito de lixo. Estava virando um depósito de lixo, era um local aberto, e os estudantes foram na Câmara Municipal levar o projeto e fazer a discussão desse projeto. Então, isso é um grande aprendizado para esses estudantes de nono ano. Outra coisa que é característica da prefeitura é o trabalho colaborativo de autoria, o TCA, que é um trabalho que eles fazem no final do ensino fundamental, em Dendro, de Elementary School, e, e que tem que ser baseado na realidade da escola. Então, a gente trabalhou, né, isso daqui é uma aluna minha, que está desenvolvendo, uma aluna de mestrado, 
a Karina, ela é professora da rede e ela está trabalhando com essa metodologia da árvore, onde na raiz, né, no planejamento, você coloca o que temos, é, na copa o que queremos e no tronco é como faremos para chegar do que temos ao que queremos. Tem que terminar. Mais ou menos isso. Oi? Acabamos. Ok, so we're, we're going to stop now. It's 10.20, so if anyone has another class or other reasons why you have to leave, you should feel free to leave at this point. But you, you can continue, and as many people as would like to stay are obviously welcome to stay, and we do. We will have coffee after, so we'll have time to ask questions after. Okay, so, so I need to any questions from the floor? Do you have anything more that you want to say? Uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's So you mentioned like um, essentially how you create cultural rationales and sort of the possibility of collaborating with many social groups when you create this curriculum. Do you collaborate with indigenous communities that are directly impacted by this environmental disaster? Okay. Uh, I have a uh, research about environmental disasters in uh, I have many things to present uh, about the national campaign uh, for uh, projects uh, about uh, risky areas and education about this. Yeah, and my students, my doctoral students, analyzes the projections around the, the Brazil. And uh, we write a paper about this. I send you, if you uh, like, uh, analyzing the practices, the collaborative practices of the analysis of the risk, discuss of the, uh, of the risk, discuss uh, about the habitation situation. And it's important to, to uh, engage for a, a change, but not a, a easy solution. There aren't a easy solutions. Thank you so much for your time. No problem. Well, I, I, I just wanted to say that I asked, go back to the question I asked you. I think this thing with the risk speaks to your point, Ana Carolina, that if you can increase people's awareness of the risks, then hopefully you can get them to me. But your all of this has to do with voluntary action. In other words, to convince people that they should do this. Okay. Now, there's a simple solution, and that is if they don't do it, then you will tax them for not doing it. And we have to remember in the United States that uh, when I was growing up, the marginal tax on the high incomes was 90%. Very easy to reduce consumption of the very rich by just taking their money away. Okay, and so Franklin Roosevelt, people, people don't know this. In Franklin Roosevelt in 1937, asked the Congress to put a 100% tax on any amount earned, earned, not wealth, but earned over $25,000. Boom, all gone, okay? And we, today, I think the message has to be to low-income people that if you call, if we, the society, has enough interest in reducing consumption that is willing to take away the money, give it to the government. Now, hopefully government's not corrupt, but take the go money, government money, and then put it, not necessarily give it 
to low income people. It's not like that, but to do stuff in environment, to reduce the risk of disasters, to take public money and act in the public good. But we're not going to do this. Yeah. But, but unless we, this enters into the curriculum, the idea that economic behavior and environmental behavior are linked very closely and that we have to deal with this to re-achieve some sense of biodiversity because we're destroying the biodiversity. Yes. Totally. Okay. Human beings are destroying it. Right. Yeah, the economic is important. Working with government. So for example, we in California and Florida as well, uh, to first, they need to be aware of these risks to the vulnerable uh, communities, what they are, but um, they need also to hear from these communities. So usually we have some engagements with these vulnerable communities, uh, especially in Santa Cruz and Florida, that I have projects in these both areas. And uh, what we have been hearing from these people is that they don't feel that their actions will really make a change. Mm -hmm. They need support from the government. So just taxing them, I no. don't think would solve completely. Actually, they are feeling Actually. powerless. So for example, there was one um, San Jose State University PhD student that I co-advised with his thesis. He uh, interviewed a lot of people and he compared, for example, Latin, um, Latins, uh, Latinos mm -hmm. with white people from Santa Cruz vulnerable areas. And on their discourse, the uh, Latin people would try to, you know, alone so little things like, okay, I need to move from here. And white people are more like thinking broad with, you know, we have to go to the government. We can change this with big implementation. So there is a difference on how they really feel that they can act in the environment. It reflects a reality. Yeah, it reflects yeah, reality. Yeah, exactly. It reflects reality. They yeah. don't have any power <laughs> to do it. Yeah. It's not stupid. But, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think the approach is not only, you know, taxing, but giving more support. So these people can, you can empower these people in vulnerable so areas. So who, who should give the support? Oh. Who should give the support? This is, uh, yeah. well, the, yeah. government. the government. Our the government. Rules. But the government. It because isn't, can, yeah, for example, not. you mentioned uh, along a river in the Santa Cruz that was flooded right. several times. These people, they just feel, uh, you know, lonely. And how well, can I move to another place? I don't have I money agree. to maintenance and so on, you know? Tax is important, but not uh, sufficient. Uh, we need to... Uh, <coughs> to work with uh, social, economic, and uh, scientific, uh, natural problem together, not only economic, but economic is important too. But <laughs> so, I have one question for you. So, uh, for example, usually the climate change discourse goes really uh, a lot on the individual contribution, like as an individual, you no. can eat less meat, Ride your bike and so on. No, no. And and how the teachers in Brazil, how they are um, bringing this issue to the students? Are they also going to this? You know, you have to do this, this, and that. Or are they more on giving a broad scenario of how they can have their voice heard by the government? How they can really help on big changes? You know, yes. how, from your work with teachers there, how how do you feel that? Now, uh, the field thing in, in Sao Paulo, there are many projects, collectives. For example, a constructive collective garden, constructive collective park. And in this process, uh, the students work uh, together. <laughs> and if environmental, uh, the a Constituição Brasileira, uh -huh. for example, meio ambiente é um bem coletivo. Uh -huh. Então, a principal coisa para você trabalhar a educação ambiental é trabalhar o gerenciamento coletivo dos bens. Desse bem ambiental, que muitas vezes, por ser visto como de todos, é visto como de ninguém. E não só com uma questão antropocêntrica. Eu tenho que proteger o meio ambiente, senão eu vou acabar morrendo. E muito menos individual. Então, toda essa discussão ela é feita com os professores. 
Porque quando você trabalha com educação ambiental crítica, você sai do individual para o coletivo. E você sai da questão né, dos comportamentos para a questão do pensar essa questão da transformação é mais profunda. Existe a, a necessidade de uma transformação da sociedade, da forma como ela gerencia. E aí acaba levando para as questões de desigualdade, que são é, acabam sendo consideradas um problema ambiental. E como que a gente lida com isso? Como que a gente vê o meio natural em relação a isso? É, e como que a gente encontra formas de lutar contra isso? É, e acho que ah, o discurso desses estudantes, por exemplo, que eu mostrei anteriormente, quando eles vão na Câmara Municipal é, é e fazem é, essa né? discussão, eles falam, nós temos o direito de não ter uma escola do lado de um depósito de lixo. Uhum. Nós temos o direito de ter um espaço para andar, para caminhar. A nossa região não tem espaços de lazer. Eles falam isso no discurso. Então, é perceber isso e perceber que existe um direito a uma existência digna. Todo mundo tem direito, um direito constitucional, a uma existência uhum. digna. Uhum. E que a questão ambiental ela faz parte dessa existência digna. Uhum. É, então, quando eu falo falta de hora verde, bom, mas isso é um problema, poderia ser olhado como um problema menor, mas não é. Porque chega a determinado momento que você quer ir a uma área com menos poluição, menos barulho, menos... Né? E, e você não ter esse direito né, de usufruir dos benefícios ambientais, que isso é privado para as comunidades mais vulneráveis. É verdade. Tá o que eu vejo muito na educação é exatamente o foco mais assim, no individual. Né? Então, mas na educação ambiental é totalmente... Todas as práticas, é que não deu tempo, né? mas todas as práticas que a gente ia mostrar são práticas coletivas. Então, tem essa escola que fez um projeto, é uma escola de educação de adultos, nem né? sei se isso existe na Califórnia. Educação de adultos? De EJA. Educação de jovens e adultos, pessoas que não puderam estudar na época tem, certa. Sim, tem. tem. Escola, e tem. também eles trouxeram aí as práticas, né? nesse mapa, achei muito interessante, porque a maioria era imigrante, e eles trouxeram quais as práticas de plantio que existiam, onde eles moravam, onde eles nasceram, e construíram ali um, um, um jardim, uma horta coletiva, que a horta pela horta em si, para levar uma face para casa, não faz muito sentido. Mas a horta, enquanto processo de construção coletiva, de planejamento coletivo, do pensar o que vamos plantar. Uma coisa é plantar uma alface, outra coisa é plantar uma punk, que é uma planta alimentícia não convencional. Então, ela vai trazendo elementos aí importantes para essa construção é, do estar junto né, de, nessa população que foi marginalizada, porque quem estuda em EJA lá em São Paulo são as populações que não tiveram a chance, que foram expulsas da escola, digamos assim, pela sociedade. Tiveram que retornar quando estão mais velhas, com filhos criados... É, e que já tem alguma condição, algum tempo para estudar. Então, todos os projetos são projetos coletivos e projetos articulados aos saberes da comunidade. Então, esse é de uma pós-doc, por exemplo, que ela está trabalhando com uma comunidade indígena, por incrível que pareça, as escolas do município de São Paulo, a gente tem duas escolas que são dentro de comunidades indígenas, essa é uma delas, onde eles construíram uma trilha para explicar a cultura deles, para quem não é indígena. E ela está trabalhando, eles estão construindo programas de rádio para trabalhar é, o compartilhamento dessas culturas, o respeito ao outro. Né? E o outro pode ser também o meio ambiente, a outra pessoa, o outro ser vivo, é fundamental nesse processo. Né? Então, as práticas que a gente tem procurado construir são práticas que vêm desse seio da comunidade, da escola, e não são levadas para. Mas, a partir das práticas que já existem, a gente traz uma referência, traz uma outra ideia de uma que uma outra escola desenvolveu e tenta mapear e implementar essas práticas em outros locais. Então, a gente tem feito muitos estudos sobre as práticas escolares do ambiente. Aqui, eu não sei, bom, a Tati conhece, a Lola, uhum. né, ela participou de um projeto comigo em 2018, 
Né? A Lola é uma das que estão aí. Lola is project. Lola is é, student. É, mas eu não sei se dá para mostrar. Eu posso, não sei como está o tempo de vocês. Né? Mas, assim, tem outras coisas aí. Eu acabei trazendo muitas coisas. É, porque eu estava pensando que era uma palestra seguida, né? não mais como conversação. É, não tinha entendido muito bem a proposta. Então, é, essa é a, a gente tem uma comissão ambiental lá na USP, a Comissão Ambiental da Biologia, que leva também a, esse conceito de comissão ambiental para escolas públicas. Como a escola pode constituir a sua comissão ambiental e como ela pode planejar as suas práticas. Né? Então, eles explicam como eles começaram na USP, como eles também podem começar. Então, a gente tem tido escolas com comissões ambientais com alunos de ensino médio, né? com projetos de coletivos, onde os alunos vão percebendo essa realidade no momento que é investido. É, eles poderiam nunca perceber que ali tem um espaço ali vazio onde as pessoas começam a jogar lixo não é uma coisa adequada eles eles teriam direito a algo melhor então é mais ou menos isso que é essa educação ambiental associada com a perspectiva da equidade tem que trabalhar I, uh, I work about my projects. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I write for understanding. You want to talk? Okay, okay. okay. No problem. No, I just. <laughs> Sorry about this. I'm going to go away. I'm not sick. It's not no, cold. It's, it's not the flu. I got tested. It's just a nasty cold. And and my cough lingers. So we did a um a study. Well, we developed some curriculum with um, climate scientists from both um and um teachers and I was a great project on, on um, environmental curriculum and change. And um, we also did an evaluation of the study. And um, um, teacher in service here at Stanford, everything by the book. <laughs> And uh, we will never forget this. There was a seventh grader. We had an assessment about what kids understand about climate change. There was one question that said, uh, it snowed in Arizona. Yeah. Explain. Mm -hmm. So the kid writes the right answer. Mm -hmm. It talks about the difference between climate weather and you know, everything he learned, absolutely the right answer. And the last sentence was, and I don't believe in climate change anyway. Yes. <laughs> Seventh yes. grade. Yes. Okay. And we talked about this for two weeks, um, all of us in the group, you know, graduate students, science teachers, um, the two professors, David Lobel, as described today in the Stanford report. I don't know if you saw it. Look at it. Look at the Stanford report. Um, he was, he and, um, Different ball. Oh, so the, the pandemic, the effects of yeah. No, this was way before. Yeah, yeah, before. before. Long time ago. Yeah. Long time ago. Yeah. Long time ago. Yeah. 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 You read this paper. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, anyway, we talked about that and we said, look, the kid is at school, learns about climate change, understands it, knows the facts, for God's sake, gets an, an A in the test. And then sits at dinner with his family, and the family says, It's close, it's uh, you know, it's a democratic conspiracy, blah, blah, blah. It's so sad. It is so sad. We are uh, really study with Brian Brown here, yeah. uh, a participatory research with uh, marine educators, yeah. because we wanted to understand better what were the challenges in teaching about, you know, ocean related climate change right. issues. And um, one of the things that they came up with was um, 
a lot of these basic science knowledge. So, for example, chemistry, physics, to understand the concepts, you know, and how climate is changing and being affected and so on. So, um, when I see, like, for example, we have been using that, it is